If you're not a member of the Lord's church, allow me to say, ladies and gentlemen, that there is but one church. Now, I realize that denominationalism is divided into and splintered into some 1,500 different groups. But if you read carefully the pages of the New Testament, you'll find that the Lord in heaven has only one church. He has but one flock. And there is but one door into the sheepfold. That is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a sectarian. I'm not trying to build up a flock. I'm not trying to build up a following. I'm simply trying to tell all of us that there is but one flock. We need to be a member of it. We must be a member of it if we're going to be saved after a while. Jesus is the great shepherd, and we're the sheep in the flock. And ladies and gentlemen, we must listen to the shepherd's voice. And when we do that, we will do what he has us to do. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, let me remind you now that if you'll turn with me into Ephesians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul says there is but one body. In Ephesians chapter 1, the last verse, he said that the church is the body. That is, there is but one church then. If the church is the body, and if there is but one body, then you can understand that there is but one church. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm saying that you must be a member of in order to be saved. According to Ephesians 5, verses 22, 23, the Apostle Paul said that Jesus is the head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul said, By one spirit we all baptized in the one body. Now, my friends, the way that you become a member of the Lord's church is simply to believe in Jesus with all of your heart and then be willing to repent of your sins, a genuine repentance from your heart, and then to accept him by being baptized into his precious name. Baptism is the act that moves you out of the world and places you in the realm of safety. And that realm of safety or that state of safety is none other than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's the head of. Jesus shed his blood to purchase it in Acts 20, 28, and 29. He told the apostle Peter and the other apostles in Matthew 16, 18 that he would build his church upon the confession uttered by the apostle Peter. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, that other foundations can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Isaiah, the great messianic prophet, said in Isaiah 28, 16, that a stone would be laid in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a sure foundation stone. The apostle Peter says that he is the head of the corner, that is Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a church upon this earth, and this church is known as the church, the body, the bride of Christ. You must become a member of it. You must live in it faithful unto death. This church is composed of individual congregations. Every congregation is independent and autonomous in nature. Every congregation, having men qualified, are to have elders and deacons to serve that church. Now, my friends, on the other hand, these men are not gods. They're not lords. They're nothing more than servants of Almighty God. And the purpose of them is simply to shepherd the flock. They're referred to as shepherds. They're referred to as overseers. They're referred to as presbyteries or bishops or elders. You understand that? Every congregation then who have men that meet the qualification laid down by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 ought to immediately ordain and recognize these men to take control. I'm talking about the oversight of that particular congregation. At the very same time, we, I'm talking about members of the church, need to understand where the authority of these men start and where it stops. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5 said that they're not to lord it over the flock. They have authority. They have control of the flock as shepherds do the sheep. They are not to coerce them. They are not to force them. They're not to lord it over them. This is what the Apostle Peter said. But through leadership and through the emulation of their lives, people follow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have wandered a long way from this. And our congregations are full of men now that are dictators. They're trying to dictate what ought to be done in the pulpit. They're dictating what needs to be done with the building. They're dictating what can be done in the parking lot. They're dictating about what is to be done with the church monies. And my friends, this is not the work of an eldership. The eldership has control of the flock. Now, nowhere 
can I find surely a member of the Lord's church that has deviated and de degenerated in his mind to the point that he thinks that the church building is the church. Now, I know that we've got a lot of people that are leaning that way. But when we get right down to the final analysis, surely we don't have any preacher that will stand up and defend these buildings and say that they are the church. All right, if these buildings are not the church, if this real estate that the church utilizes does not constitute the church, then pray tell me how the eldership has control of it. The Bible said that the eldership has control of the flock. They are to take oversight of the flock. Now, since the flock is the church, then I, ladies and gentlemen, am going to limit this to members of the church in their lives and has nothing to do with the real estate or the property controlled by the brethren. Now, I'm willing to defend that, and I think it'll hold water, and I believe that all of you Bible students that will think just a minute will find out that I'm on the right track. Now, my friends, we have been gone, we have been led astray, and we have gone astray simply because our leaders have led us that way. Now, at the same time, that is no excuse. The God of heaven will not overlook us simply because we have been taught wrong. But at the very same time, we're going to find right here in the 34th chapter of the book of Ezekiel today what God thinks about his leaders that do not do what he said. Now, ladies and gentlemen, turn with me as a preface. Let me preface my remarks today by calling your minds to the eldership once more as recorded by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy. Now, notice, if you will, that we have here in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy the qualification of an elder. You notice this? Now, then the Apostle Paul, down in about verse 8, makes the, de the, the statement that deacons in like manner must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, and so forth. There's a list of qualifications here that deacons must meet. Now then, if you'll continue to read this book very carefully, you'll find that the Apostle Paul has much to tell Timothy about the eldership. Now, in verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Rebuke not an elder, but exhort him as a father. Now, not only will this apply to the eldership, though I think that he's talking about elderly men here, He's simply telling Timothy, as a young man, that he ought to be courteous. They ought to know something about Christian decorum. He said, rebuke not an elder, but exhort him as a father. The younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers. The younger as sisters in all things. There is a behavior that is come encumbered upon God's people. Now, in verse 17 of the very same chapter, I'm in chapter 5, 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in the word and in teaching. Now, if I understand anything correctly, this teaches that it's possible and it's proper to pay an elder if he's given full time to the work of the church. Now, I read to you last week from Adam Clark, and Adam Clark said in his preface to chapter 3, verse 1, that in Bible times there were no such thing as non-preaching elders. Now, that's a far cry, ladies and gentlemen. That's a long ways from what we have today. We have men that cannot teach. We have men that cannot lead public prayer. Now, they are calling themselves elders, and the congregation has recognized them as such. My friends, it's unscriptural. It's, un it's not right and contrary to God's law. And the thing that we must do if we're going to clean the house, if we're going to clean up the mess that we're in, is to start right here at the top and go down to the bottom. We're going to have to get some men in the eldership and men that are deacons that know what it's all about. They understand what it's all about. They know what the qualifications are. They understand the teaching of God's law because they study diligently the Bible. And they can understand when false prophets and false teachers and false preachers come along. And these are the men that have the ability and the qualification to shut them out of these men. Now, many of them have gone out. The Apostle Paul and John and Peter, all of them, warn about preachers and leaders and men that come along that will lead away the flock. Now, Paul said in Acts 20, 28, and 29, into the, or speaking to the elders of the church that Ephesus, to take heed to yourselves and to the flock, over which the Holy Spirit has made you bishop to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know, he said, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in, right there in the eldership, and men shall arise from among yourselves, 
Now, my friends, we have gotten politics into the church. We have permitted politics to enter into the church. You know, it's almost a physical impossibility in the world to get a doctor to testify against another doctor in the court of law. Now, the very same thing is true with lawyers. It's almost a physical impossibility for one lawyer to bring a charge against another lawyer. It's almost a physical impossibility for a politician in Washington to rebuke and censor another pol uh, another politician. Now, the same thing is true in the church. It has gotten to the point that one elder will not say anything about another elder, even though he himself knows he's disqualified or not qualified. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is wrong. Now, Paul said that the elders are to watch. They're to watch one another, and they're to watch the flock. Why? Because men will arise from among yourselves to lead the disciples away after them. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul said that the Spirit saith expressly that in light of time, some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons through the hypocrisies of men that speak lies, branded in their own conscience as with a hot iron, forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meat which God created to be received, listen, with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, some 2,000 years ago, the Pope of Rome said this very thing. Or I'm talking about when the Pope began to arrive. The Catholic Church started in 533, so we're talking roughly 1,500 years ago, and the Pope began to make laws for the Church. Now, if the Church had been wise, if the Church had been on the toes, they would not have permitted men to come in here and say that it was wrong to eat meat on a certain day. It was wrong to do this on a certain day. The Bible said that there are no sacred days in the church, and the Apostle Paul said that every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it be received with thanksgiving. I'm talking about fish. I'm talking about pigs. I'm talking about anything. The Bible says they're all here before us to eat if we will accept them as God says we ought to. But now then we had men, men who wanted to make laws, and we still have men who want to make laws that come along and say, you can do this, but you cannot do that in violation of God's law. This is one of the pictures drawn by Daniel way back in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel when he's talking about the little horn, which is none other than the Pope of Rome. He said that it will change the law and change the season. Now we've got brethren that are doing the very same thing. The Apostle Paul said that I said expressly that in a lot of times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. In the last chapter of the next book, I'm talking about 2 Timothy 4, 1, the Apostle Paul said, I charge thee therefore in the sight of God and Christ Jesus, who shall judge the living and the dead by his appearing in kingdom, preach the word. Who's he talking to? Talking to Timothy. Preach the word. Be urgent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, keep to themselves teachers after their own lust, and will turn aside their ears from the truth, and turn aside unto fable. But be thou sober in all things, suffer hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're living in this age. It was true in Paul's time. It has been true in every age that we have men that will not, do not, do not intend to endure sound doctrine. They don't want it. They want to hear something that's smooth. They want to hear something that's pleasing. Just back like back in Jeremiah's day, they had prophets who would say, peace, peace, when there was no peace. We found it time and time again. And you'll have men that tell you that it doesn't make any difference. Whether you've got elders that are qualified or not, it doesn't make any difference whether they have these qualifications or not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me hear, let me say right here that God laid these qualifications down and he meant for us to adhere to them. 